Good afternoon to all of you. Pleasure to be here. And uh, Steve gave a wonderful presentation, uh, but we're going to go back to millimeter wave now. <laughs> and uh, before me, there were two wonderful presentations from uh, students at Georgia Tech, one an alum and the other is a freshman student. So I hope uh, my presentation is at least half as good as theirs. So with that, let me get uh, started. So I work a lot in the semiconductor area at Georgia Tech. I've been here for 28 years, and I'm gonna share with you some of the work that's going on in packaging and uh, in the context of uh, 6G communications. And by the way, I realize I'm between you and your cocktail hour. So I'm gonna try and go through this as quickly as possible. I'd be very happy to answer questions. So let me try and share with you what I mean by packaging and what I mean by advanced packaging. I'm sure all of you are familiar with printed circuit boards. That's a form of packaging. Now, if you look at any kind of an electronic system and you ask yourself at the holistic level, what is the system made of? You can break it up into two parts. One is what goes inside of the chip and what goes outside of the chip. And anything that goes outside of the chip, we call it packaging. So printed circuit board is a form of packaging. You have the IC package that's a form of packaging and including your housing, it's a form of packaging as well. Now, if you look at systems, you know there's a certain volume associated with it. And what we have been trying to do at Georgia Tech is to figure out ways by which you can reduce the volume of future systems while at the same time increasing or improving the functionality of these systems. Now, if you look at the transistors today, they are at nanoscale, but they constitute only between 10 to 20% of the volume of a system today. The rest of it, between 80 to 90%, comes from what goes outside of that chip. And the reason why that's the case is because there's a big length difference between what we are able to do inside of the chip in the form of transistors and what we are able to do outside of the chip, uh, more from a packaging standpoint. And over the years, we've been, reduced, we, we've been able to reduce that length scale as much as possible. So the goal here is to continuously reduce the length difference between what goes on inside of the chip and what goes on outside of the chip shown here as a package. Around 20 years back, this length difference was of the order of around six orders of magnitude. Today, it is at around three orders of magnitude. We've been able to reduce that quite a bit. And moving forward, we want to make, try and figure out ways by which the size of the transistors inside of the chip is the same as the size of the components outside of the chip in the package. So assuming we're able to do that, right? you have the chip the same size as the package or the printed circuit board, and that will allow us to reduce the volume occupied by systems. So with that as a background, let me put this in the context of wireless communications. And um, I believe earlier today, there was a presentation on 5G and uh, there was a presentation before me as well on, on uh, some of the millimeter wave types of uh, communication techniques, um, especially when you bring in machine learning. Now I'm gonna focus on 6G here, bump up the frequency even more. And one of the questions you may ask is, you know, 5G millimeter wave is still not here. Why would you want to work on 6G? And I believe that's where the universities come in. We need to think far ahead and try to figure out some of the, what are the technologies we need to be working on. And 6G is one of those which is probably 10 years out and it's, and it's a good time for the universities to start looking into various aspects of the problem. Now, the reason why 6G is so important is because of the bandwidth you're able to get. So if you bump up the frequency, 10% bandwidth, you get a lot more, and therefore you can, your data rate can increase quite a bit. So the projections for 6G is of the order of a tera, around a terabit per second, depending on the frequency at which you uh, uh, run these uh, channels. And as you can see, it's much, much higher compared to 5G in terms of capacity. You also want to have pervasive con connectivity. There was a nice discussion going on today about cars communicating with other cars. And if you look at each car as a component, then you need a high density that you need to support. 
And with 6G, the idea is you know, to try and increase it by an order of magnitude compared to uh, 5G. And of course, intelligent communications, this whole issue of artificial intelligence and embedding it into a lot of these devices is becoming very important. It needs to become part of wireless communication. So I'm gonna focus this more on the hardware side. So I work quite a bit on the artificial intelligence side as well, including machine learning, but I'm gonna focus primarily on the hard, hardware side uh, in this presentation. So what are the challenges? Assuming you want to build a transmitter and a receiver at, um, at uh, 6G frequencies, then what is it that you need to sort of worry about? So if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, the millimeter wave is between 30, uh, uh, 30 gigahertz and 300 gigahertz. And if you look at that frequency range, one of the challenges that we have is the path loss depending on what frequency you actually operate it uh, at. And if you look at the 6G frequencies, some of the frequency bands that are being targeted are 140 gigahertz, 220 gigahertz, 350 gigahertz, et cetera. And at these frequencies, the signal doesn't go very far. And in addition to that, you have to worry about a lot of the attenuation that you incur because of the atmosphere basically the water vapor in the, uh, in, the, in the atmosphere and things of that nature. And that's what you see as these peaks over here. So you have to be able to build hardware that compensates for this path loss and the absorption loss. And the way you do that is to develop this antenna technology, beamforming technology that I'm sure all of us are familiar with, because you have to somehow compensate for this by very directed power and be able to scan this beam across the region that you're interested in. So one of the things going for us when you go to 6G is that as you bump up the frequency, the wavelength goes down. And as we all know, when you're trying to build antenna arrays, you try to separate these antenna elements by half lambda. So if the wavelength goes down, then you have the opportunity at hundreds of gigahertz to be able to integrate all of those antenna elements inside of a chip because the dimensions are very, very small. So the question that always needs to be asked is, is complete integration inside of a chip possible at 6G? And that's what where this graph comes in. So the half a lambda represents the minimum separation that you want to have between the antenna elements so that you reduce the side lobe levels. And this blue line that you see represents half a lambda in air where the x-axis is your frequency. Now there is another set of dots over here and that corresponds to the square root of area of a chip in millimeters when you build a lot of the transceiver circuits. Now, if you look at the line here, that is the crossover point between what goes on below 100 gigahertz and what goes on above 100 gigahertz. And if you look at the frequencies below 100 gigahertz and look at the wavelength, you'll find that the wavelength is quite large. And as a result of that, the physical dimensions of the antenna elements are large. So you have to integrate it outside of the chip or in other words, in the package. Now, if you go above 100 gigahertz, you need enough power coming out of these chips. And a lot of the power amplifiers are at these frequencies are not very efficient. So you need a large amount of area to get the power out, which means that there is no space there to integrate those antenna elements, even though these, the dimensions of these antenna elements are very, very small. So the case I'm trying to make here is that a very, very key piece of technology moving forward is called as the antenna and package technology. So you cannot integrate the antennas inside of the chip, no matter what frequency you're working at, it has to go outside of the chip to be able to get uh, uh, enough gain and things of that nature. So let's look at the link budget. So there are uh, two figures shown over here. So one corresponds to communication, let's say between two towers, 
separated over a distance of 100 meters. And here you're trying to, you have an access point where you have a transmitter array and you're communicating with handsets. Now, over a distance of 100 uh, meters, if you transmit a signal at 140 gigahertz, which is D band, the amount of loss you incur is of the order of around 133 dB. So obviously you need enough of a power level to be able to compensate for that 133 dB. And that is where this uh, figure comes in. So this is your transmitter and that is your receiver. And if you look at these numbers here, those represent the typical power num out output numbers we are able to get out of a power amplifier using some of the leading edge technologies today. So for example, you would make use of, let's say, gallium nitride, indium phosphide kinds of devices to get these power levels out, right? So you have a transmitter and the transmitter is a chip that resides in a package. And so the output of this radio after it incurs the loss in the package uh, has to be amplified through the gain of the antenna. So you build an antenna array and then you have your EIRP, let's say of the order of around 72 dBm. You transmit it over a distance of 100 meters, you incur a loss of 133 dB. Then you take the signal, you boost it up through another antenna array, and then it goes to the package on the receiver side. And notice that based on a link margin of around 11 dB that you need on the receiver side, you end up with certain metrics you need to meet from a budgeting standpoint. So for example, you have 37 dBm of output power for the transmitter. You need to allow for a loss of one dB, let's say in the package and things of that nature, including an antenna gain of around 36 dBm. Now, if you look at this link budget, this is by the way, based on a 128 qualm kind of a communication link you'll find that there are three very, very important elements here that you need to worry about. One is this antenna and package technology that has to go outside of the chip in the package. The second is you have to make sure that all of the power from the transmitter chip goes out into the antenna with no loss being incurred in the package itself. So that is where this one dB of loss comes in at 140 gigahertz and above. And the third is, if you look at these uh, transmitters, they are very, very inefficient. So they generate a huge amount of heat. And if you look at these heat fluxes here, 150 watts per centimeter squared, that's what the CPUs generate today in your laptop computers. So that's the kind of heat we need to worry about for a lot of these wireless communication modules. So how do you go about doing that? And that's where advanced packaging comes in. So we work with different types of materials. Some are conducting materials, some are insulating materials, and some of those are shown here, and we develop processes around it. And the idea here is on micro miniaturization. So we're trying to look at micron types of dimensions or micrometer types of dimensions to be able to miniaturize the, 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 the size of a lot of these systems. So some examples of processes or, uh, or, or technologies available today is called LTCC, low temperature co-fired ceramic technology. There's a company called Kyocera that builds, uh, builds this. They're based out of uh, San Diego. Uh, they have a plant here, manufacturing facility here. The second is to use a low loss laminate technology similar to printed circuit board technology where you begin to laminate these copper layers on top of each other, along with dielectric materials in between. And then uh, you have uh, companies like Infineon and TSMC. They try to do integration at the wafer level, which is at the silicon level, similar to what is shown over here. And what we've been working on for the last 10 years is to try and make use of glass as a way to do all of the integration. When I say glass, these are structured glass. They have certain special properties associated with them, specifically developed for these kinds of applications. Okay, so why glass? Now, 
if you look at silicon and ask yourself the question, why is it that, you know, silicon technology is so popular when it comes to building transistors? There are several reasons that are listed here. One is the surface roughness. It's a very, very smooth surface that you can work with to be able to build your transistors and your wiring. The second is this coefficient of thermal expansion. So if you try to, let's say, assemble a chip onto another chip that is also made of silicon, then as the temperature changes, when things, you know, when you begin to accumulate stresses and things expand and contract, since both of them have the same CTE, you know, you, there, there is no, that the reliability tends to be very, very high. The third is the young modulus, which is the stiffness. You want this to be as stiff as possible, right? To be able to build a lot of your fine devices on top of it. And you also want to make sure it's hermetic. So you do not want to it to absorb moisture. And finally, you want to have a, find a way by which you can use this material to spread the heat out where the thermal conductivity comes in. Now, if you look at glass, you'll see that the first four properties are fairly good compared to what silicon is able to provide. And this part here is very important because it is a thermal insulator as opposed to a thermal conductor, such as a silicon material. And that allows us to isolate hotspots. So one of the biggest challenges that we have when we bring chips together is they tend to thermally couple with each other. So you do not want the package to conduct that heat. So thermal insulation becomes very, very important. In addition to that, you, we talk about this panel size. This is where the cost comes in. So if you want to build large antenna arrays, the largest you'll be able to build on silicon is of the order of around 35 millimeters by 35 millimeters. If you want to go beyond that, it's very, very difficult to do that with, uh, uh, with silicon. And as a result of that, you'll find that you can reduce the cost of a lot of these substrates by working with very large panel sizes, similar to the size of printed circuits boards, and you just dice them up once you uh, build your modules. So that brings us to antenna and, uh, package. So we know that when you're trying to work at such high frequencies, you need to work with high gain antenna elements, very large antenna arrays to be able to get the gain and to be able to direct the beam in the direction you're interested in. You want full field of view, similar to what is indicated here. So you have to make use of beam forming technology, right? So, and that's what is shown here. So you have these pencil beams that you scan over the region over which you want to uh, communicate. And there are several ways to do that. One is analog. The second is digital. And I show hybrid here. One of the very key things that you need to focus on is power. The amount of power you actually consume to be able to transmit uh, these signals. So trying to reduce power is very important and that's where hybrid comes in. What I mean by hybrid is you're trying to use a combination of analog and digital beamforming technology to be able to reduce the overall power. So the way you construct these arrays is by first creating a subarray, similar to what is shown here, and then you cascade it, right? To be able to build the larger array. This is an example of a 384 element W band phased array um, that was uh, um, demonstrated, I believe, by, uh, by uh, Nokia uh, a few years back. And this green stuff essentially means it's a, it's a laminate based technology, less than 100 gigahertz. It works reasonably well. Now, what we have been trying to do is to come up with a very unique architecture shown here as a hybrid beam forming architecture to be able to operate this antenna array at let's say 140 gigahertz. So we start with a tile similar to what is shown here. And each tile consists of a two by two array. And each one of these two by two arrays, if you look at it beneath it, has a phase shifter. That's a Butler matrix right beneath it, right? That Butler matrix allows us to tilt the beam in the direction that we are interested in by making use of this RF switch, depending on how you feed that power into the various ports of that Butler matrix. Now, below that Butler matrix is the power amplifier that provides you with the power that is fed to this two by two array. 
Now, below that, you have the beam former. That's a CMOS chip. So the power amplifier is an indium phosphide chip. The beam former is a CMOS chip. And you use the beam former, you create your phase shift to be able to scan the beam in this region. So you tilt the beam and then you scan the beam. And once you go through the optimization process, you can basically show that the overall power can be minimized if you're able to optimize between these phase shifters and that beam former. Then you take this two by two array, you cascade them. There's an example of a 256 element array to be able to get enough, uh, enough gain and enough power out of this antenna array. So here is one embodiment of this antenna and package uh, uh, module that we're working on. So this is your large scale array. Beneath that, you have the passives. Those are your filters, your phase shifters and all of that. Below that is your power amplifier. And then you have your transmit chip that, you're, that is CMOS. So the key here is if you want to reduce all of the losses, you, want to, you have to vertically stack them. And that's what is indicated here. So you have the antenna array here, all your phase shifters are here. Then the question is where do you place the chips? So we take glass, right? We create cavities in them and we embed these chips in that glass. So this power amplifier chip has a thickness of around 95 microns. The CMOS chip has a thickness of around 150 microns. They come with different thicknesses. And then we create these polymer layers. We laminate it on, on the top side, and then we metallize it. And notice that this polymer material flows in the gaps between the chip and the glass and holds the chip in place. Then we take the bottom side, we expose this region of these chips, add a material, a thermal interface material that is very good at conducting heat, attach a heat spreader to it and a heat sink. So any heat that is generated by this power amplifier is pulled out from the bottom side of this module here and the radiation, the antenna arrays are radiating along this vertical direction here, right? So that's the concept. It's uh, very easy to do on a PowerPoint slide. It has taken us around four years to actually make this work. And I'll show you some of the results, right? So um, now when we work with uh, these kinds of materials, one of the things we worry about is the insertion loss of the interconnects that we're making use of, because these interconnects are being used to build all of the components. There are no discrete components. Everything is done using these wires primarily copper on polymer on glass to be able to build this. Now, if, I, if you look at this insertion loss as a function of frequency, we've tried to compare different types of materials, right? And uh, if you look at the 5G new radio band up to 40 gigahertz, the loss is very low around 0.1 dB per millimeter. Then you go to E band, it's between 0.1 to 0.2 dB per millimeter. And then you go to the higher frequency D band, you see it increases quite a bit and that's no good. So the type of glass you make use of is very, very important. And it is what we call a structured glass. Now, in addition to that, the dielectric constant of glass is quite high, not very good for antennas. And that's where polymers come in. So you need to bring in low dielectric constant materials to be able to integrate your antennas. So here are some recent results. So this is the transmit antenna array. It's an example of a four by four antenna array. And if you, these are the radiation patterns, but if you look at this, we work with 200 micron thick glass. Once this glass goes below around 200 microns, they become very flexible, very difficult to handle. So we make use of this 200 micron thick glass. It's from a company called uh, AGC in Japan. And those are your polymer layers. And you see the thicknesses here, and that's your patch antenna array. And we have been able to get a gain of around 14 dBi for a four by four uh, antenna array with a bandwidth of uh, around seven gigahertz. And then if you look at the handset side of things, you don't want uh, a broadside radiator, you want an end fire radiator. And here, these are examples of a monopole antenna. So that's your director, it's a single ended feed. And this ground plane represents your reflector. So it's a single metal layer that is being used to build uh, this uh, uh, antenna. And then you can begin to sort of uh, make it in the form of an array, example of a linear array. 
And if you look at the bandwidth, it covers the entire D band from 110 to 170 gigahertz with a quite good gain around uh, um, uh, 10 dB high. And you can see a comparison with other technologies that are out there. So it works quite well. So you also need the wires to be able to connect these various uh, types of antenna elements together and the phase shifters. There are five different types of structures we've been working on. The coplanar waveguide and the microstrip structures are probably something you're familiar with. Also substrate integrated waveguides. So we allow the electromagnetic wave to propagate directly through this glass core. VLS interconnects, we try to communicate from the top side of glass to the bottom side of glass without the need for metal, metallized connections. Planar gobo lines, we rely on surface wave propagation as a way to propagate the signals. And if you look at the loss numbers here, they're very, very low at such high frequencies. Everything is per millimeter. So the dimensions of these structures are of the order of microns. So typically the length of these wires are always less than a millimeter, okay? So, so that's the type of loss you incur. And using this, you can start building some interesting filters. This is an example of a bandpass filter that has a extremely low insertion loss, very good rejection at 140 gigahertz. Now, why do we need to embed those chips in glass? So what we try to do is to go after that budget of 1 dB for the package loss. And the way you do that is to try and eliminate or reduce the thickness of copper or the length of copper or the length of those wires as much as possible. And that's what is indicated here. So if you make use of a wire bond, you end up with 1.8 dB of loss. If you use these solder bumps, you get a loss of around 0.3 dB. And then you embed the chip, you completely eliminate the bump, you go down to around 0.2 dB at 140 gigahertz, right? So that's the concept. Get rid of the, you know, all these wires as much as you can and reduce the length of these interconnects. Now, this is something we are working on. We are not there yet. The idea is to build this eight by eight antenna array module, similar to what is shown over here. So each represents a channel. That's a power amplifier that's your CMOS uh, beam former all embedded. And uh, the process is shown over here. It's a fairly uh, interesting process in the sense that we make use of the carriers below this glass to be able to embed the chip and build these layers on the top side. And uh, this is some recent results where we've been able to build uh, uh, a one by eight array. And you see these uh, antenna elements all cascaded to each other. And part of the reason is it allows us to conserve power as opposed to making use of a power divider. And uh, so you see the die that is embedded. And the idea here is with and without the die, you want to make sure that is that there is no degradation in gain. And that is uh, what is uh, indicated here. So it's around 11.6 dB without this embedded die and around 10.7 dB um, with that embedded die. Finally, how do you get the heat out, right? And uh, so one of the ways by which you can get the heat out is just by building wires, metallized connections that connects to the bottom side of this chip that is embedded and you pull the heat out this way. And to me, that's a, a lousy way of doing integration because that space is being taken up uh, by, uh, by these thermal wires as opposed to for signaling. So that is why what we are trying to do is to expose the bottom side of the chip and connect a heat spreader directly to it so that you can completely eliminate these wires. And uh, the idea here is, you know, to be able to use uh, air cooling up to around 150 watts per centimeter squared. And beyond that, there are some other sophisticated technologies like vapor chambers and others to be able to get the heat out. This material here becomes a very, very key enabler. So trying to develop that material that has a very, very uh, high thermal conductivity is critical because that's right between this heat spreader and that chip, right? So there's a lot of research that needs to be done here. So how do you attach that chip, that, that heat spreader? So this is where a double-sided release process comes in. So we start with glass with a bottom carrier, put the chip in, and then we attach another a top, a carrier on the top. We just flip it attach the heat spreader on the other side and then release the carrier, okay? 
And remember that the dimensions of the structures we are working on over here is of the order of micrometers. Okay? So with that, you know, here are some results. And what it basically shows is that indeed, you can cool this chip because one of the metrics is this delta T, the, the temperature difference between the ambient temperature and the temperature within the chip. That spec needs to be at around 25 degrees centigrade. And we are getting close to that, but we are able to pull that heat out quite well. So with that, let me conclude. And I show this, because, you know, quite honored uh, or very proud to show this because end of the day, we do university level research and oftentimes some of the innovations in the lab just gets lost. It needs to find its way into manufacturing. And we've been working on glass now for 10 years. And what has happened since then is one of the companies in Korea, it's called SKC. They just spun out a company called Absolex where they are setting up a glass-based manufacturing factory 41 miles southeast of here in a place called Covington. And uh, a and huge amount of investment going in. And uh, the goal is to create this 400 skilled jobs over the next couple of years, right? And, uh, and this came about because of a lot of the work that has been going on at, uh, at Georgia Tech. And this was taken recently, actually, November 1st, earlier uh, this, uh, this month where um, we had this groundbreaking ceremony. So with that, let me stop here. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer. Thank you. Let's thank our speaker. Professor, I have one question. Um, fantastic work. It's, it's very gratifying to see this. I have to give a quick uh, a historical note. Uh, uh, 20 years ago, R.C. Hansen, who's very well known in the antenna field, uh, came to the conclusion that you could never do uh, antennas on a chip or antennas in package. And unfortunately, that set things back quite a few years. So it's very gratifying to see that you've pushed ahead and been able to make that happen. And it looks like for a very bright future. The question I have is, you showed a, a beautiful uh, patch array and uh, using it for beam forming, can see all kinds of side lobes. If you look at the spatial frequency spectrum of that, I think you'll find that you're getting lobes, especially on the sides, that have nothing to do with the periodicity of the spacing of the elements. And uh, Aklish, maybe you can comment about this later, but uh, I believe you're probably getting some evanescence happening here and getting surface waves on the side. There are ways, of course, to mitigate that, and I'd be delighted to discuss it, but I just wanted to get your comment on that. Absolutely. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big problem. And it's something that we look at very, very carefully. So you're right, you have the evanescent modes and uh, you do get a lot of these surface wave modes that you need to worry about. So a lot of the antenna elements that we design, we try to take a you know, careful look at it. There's a lot of EM simulations go, that go on and things like that. But as I said, this is work in progress. So there is a lot of room for improvement over here. Yeah. Uh, question I have is uh, the, you're, you're working on the heat from the power amplifier and on the mm -hmm. part of the chip. Uh, how much heat is generated by the processing required for the scanning antennas? Yes. So there are the, the part that I did not show over here is the signal processing part, right? But if you look at the CMOS beamformer that I showed, the heat flux associated with that is actually less than what you see for the power amplifier that is shown over here. So that's what we are trying to tackle. And then, of course, there is a signal processing element that needs to come in as well. The question is, should that be integrated on the same module or should it be separate, right? Uh, so as I said, this is still work in progress. 6G is another 10 years away. So hopefully, you know, the next few years, we'll be able to address a lot of these issues. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. We have a question uh, from the web. Yeah, we've got a question from Dr. Jim Brakehall. I'm not sure if I'm qualified to read this one. That's why I was asking you to come here. <laughs> On type of densely packed current sheet array to get rid of grading lobes instead of the half wavelength spacing criteria and also considering randomly spaced arrays. I think what Jim is saying, have you considered other array configurations in order to get rid of the side lobes? So, so, so the issue is the following, right? So it's not just about the antenna itself, but also how you would be able to 
integrate the electronics beneath the antenna. So we need to consider all of those when we actually come up with an architecture. So the answer is yes. And, but what happens is if you begin to sort of deviate too much in terms of the types of antenna elements you want to work with, trying to integrate the electronics beneath the antenna becomes very, very challenging. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Okay, thank you to the speaker. And uh, can we announce the good news or would you like no, to please. wait? No, you go ahead, I, please. Yeah. So uh, our, our esteemed professor here is at, from Georgia Tech is moving on to Penn State. And would you kindly tell him your new position? Yes, I'll, I'm joining there January 1st as the head of the Department of Electrical Engineering. Thank you. <laughs>